looking at this idea of there being market structures, one which was a monopoly, the other was perfectly competitive, and we have decided that we are wanting to move towards perfect competition, because that's our ideal. In order to be able to do that, we're going to need to know exactly what the structures are, how they work. We're going to need to discuss and debate whether a monopoly is actually good or bad. Right? And the examiner can ask you this. Right? So identify what is a monopolist, explain how is a monopolist created, evaluate. Is a monopolist all that bad? Right? Now, in the code there, WIC 3 n we can all arrive, it would be awesome. Now, one of the things that was going to cause, well, yeah, a monopolist was going to have as its advantage this idea of economies of scale. And we talked about a couple of them. First idea was that you were able, because of the size, because you're producing, your output level is so big that you are able to get cost reductions on products you are wanting to buy as a business. So the example we used the other day was about computers. If you've got a very big business and you're wanting to buy not one computer but a hundred, then the company is probably going to be able to give you a discount on that. And the phrase that we use is called bulk buying. And if you have been to one of the supermarkets where they do bulk buying, Right, you will have seen people just loading up their trolleys with you know, multi-packs of everything because they get it cheaper doing it that way. We can also sell a lot of products, and by doing so, we're actually able to reduce the costs involved with that. We are, as said, able to potentially, as a monopolist, gain from marketing economies, so we're able to, so it's more affordable, to have marketing perhaps all around the world, or really clever marketing, really expensive marketing, marketing that other businesses just can't afford to do, because they don't have the money. We could also hire some specialist managers. We need people who work in this particular section of the business. Well, we can't afford that, so we've just got the CEO, he's going to have to do everything. That's kind of how those sorts of things work. Uh, I taught at a school in New Zealand for a brief period of time, and the deputy principal of the school was also a classroom teacher, and she was also the head of something else within the school, and she was also something else, and it was because it was a very, very small school. They didn't have the staff to be able to have Managers for the different things that was just there, all right? Which worked out quite nicely for me because at the time I was just training to be a teacher, so she would say, "Okay, you take the class. I need to go and do a meeting over here." So she would do that, and then she would come back and we would reteach parts of what we were doing, right? She would refocus them, whatever it was needed, and then, oh, "Okay, now I need to go and do a meeting over there." So the idea is that if you are bigger, you can afford to have specialists management working in your business. How about, have a go at explaining one of those. Did we do that one the other day? Nope, all right. Have a go, one of those that you've got written into your notes, all right, that you're able to take screen caps from the slides, or just copy and paste from the slides. One, internal economy of scale. Any of them, which everyone takes you fancy. Have a right up with it. Here Thank 
Uh, what I'd is just about how you could increase your cost of production. That's it. And it's just about the size of the business. So you're on the right, you've, you've got something there. Yeah, you do. So because your, your business is producing lots of products, Yes, absolutely right, Emma. Well done. That is a very good example of an internal. Hang on. Yep. And so, by doing that, by having specialist management, then they are able to reduce their costs. Yes, they have that link. Yes. Well done, Lancelot. Specialist management, managing the business enables them to have lower costs. All right, that's the link. Yep. Yes, a good job. Well done. That works as well. Yes, it is. You're absolutely right. Ethan, you're absolutely right. That it is a way to measure your efficiency, but I'm wanting you to explain one of them. So either managerial economy, financial economy, um, bulk buying, marketing, anything on those sort of lines, just explain it. What does it mean? Good. Yeah, that's right. That's it. You haven't really explained as much as you've just stated, but no, we're getting it. Yep, that's good, Brandon. That, that is absolutely right. That there is a long way of response to stop the unit feasible with all batches of production available. That's absolutely right. All right. It wasn't really what I was asking, but that is true. Yep. All right. So, to make it simpler, what does managerial economies of scale mean? What does bulk buying mean? Yeah. Right, let's do the bulk buying one. That might be easier. What does bulk buying mean? Right. I've given you the economy, and all you have to do now is just explain what it means. Yeah. 
McDonald's is one of the most recognized brands in the entire world. Right? McDonald's is so well recognized that you know the letter M in McDonald's? Yeah? It is so well recognized that you know when children are learning the alphabet? What number of them now when they see the letter M when they're just learning the alphabet, they don't say M, they say McDonald's. That's how powerful the brand is. Probably second only to one one of the Nike pick or the Nike push. Right. Oh, can I tell you another story about brand? You know Nike, I just mentioned them. Yeah. You know, what's their slogan? Just do it. Yeah. One of the best marketing slogans ever created. Very simple, very straightforward. How long do you think it took them to come up with it? How long would it take you to come up with a slogan like that? Okay. Okay. It took a room full of people, all marketers, over a month to come up with the slogan. But once they came on to it, they go, oh, 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 just do it. That's our slogan. Let's, let's do that. And it is a brilliant slogan. Right. McDonald's, I'm loving it. And it's not too bad. Pretty close. Yeah. Do you see that they both have got three words in them? There's a psychological thing about threes. You remember them easier, therefore they pop out of your head easier, or pop into your head and pop out easier. You're able to recall them if they're in threes. All right? And if you think to yourself, that's just crazy, if you were watching a certain former president of the United States at his rallies that he used to give, they were all three word slogans. Yeah? Lock her up, lock him up. Yeah? Yeah, it works really well because it's three words. So if you're giving a speech to anybody or English or anything like that, come up with a three word slogan and just add it in and then add it in again. By the way, the rule of three is supposed to also apply to you presenting as well. So you don't say it once, you say it three times in different places. Yeah? Now, financial economies, more affordable loans, because you're a big business, you can get the loans, but you can also get them at a cheaper rate than probably anybody else. Technological economies, you are so big, you've got so much output, you're able to use the latest and greatest technologies that there are. Of course, there are some good technologies out there at the moment. This school's got a 3D printer. You see that? It does. We're, probably we're going to move it. It'll come down here. Not in my room. Yep. Or it'll be down. The school's got a VR machine. Virtual reality. Yep. Just they could do so much more with all of those sorts of things, couldn't they? That. The latest and greatest technology, wouldn't it be cool? I, as I said to you, I might have said this to you before, I'm really looking forward to, good, um, to Apple glasses. I think it's going to be and it syncs with your watch and your phone and all of that. Yeah. Uh, the NBA, those of you who know the NBA, right? They, um, when they were in lockdown last year, 
and they were all in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, the, they all got, well, the NBA is an organization, so the individual teams, they all bought a smart ring for all of the players. And you've possibly seen it on TV. And it's like your watch, right? It's a smart ring that keeps track of your temperature, your sleep patterns, all of those, your heart rate, all of those sorts of things. And then it syncs with all of your other devices. But it meant that the, the team could actually, uh, like the, the managers of the team could keep track on their phone of all of the players' temperatures and heart rates and all of those sorts of things to see if they were well or not. Well, those sorts of technologies are out there. Amazing. Just think about how we could use all of those. Research and development. Because you're a really big firm, you can afford to do research and development. Yeah. Has anybody heard of this firm before? This business. I'm going to put a name up here. Have you heard of this one? What? You have? Yeah. How have you heard it? You've heard it at school. What do they make? What do they make? Yes, they do. What else do they make? Sorry? Not to my knowledge. All right. Has anybody ever used a post-it note? They made them. Yeah? All right. Their, their, full, their original name was Minnesota Manufacturing and Mining. They were a chemical creation company, mining things out the ground, creating products out of what they found. One of the things that they manufactured quite a lot of in the old days was glue. And there was a guy and he was inventing, he was using glue, different types of, inventing different types of glue, but there are different types of glue, if you're not aware of that, right? And he invented a glue that didn't fully stick. Oh dear, what am I gonna do with this glue, yeah? Turns out it worked really well to put it on the back of little tiny pieces of paper so that they could be stuck and then restuck and stuck and free and post it notes. Yeah. They also make uh, the plastics, uh, like screen protectors, sort of idea. They also make electronic cables. So anywhere with these wires, a number of them potentially are going to be made by 3M. And if you've been in a car traveling at night and you're driving along the road, or when it's just dark, so early in the morning, and you'll see, you see out of your eye, you see along the side of the road, there's like um, little poles in the ground telling you where the road stops. And how do you see them at night? They've got a reflective tape on them, 3M. And they're all 3M. Every single reflective tape in the world, effectively, is from 3M. What about the reflective jackets that people wear if they're at, you know, emergencies or whatever? 3M. Yeah, they go running with the reflective tapes and 3M. Yeah. We used to use a technology called an overhead projector. 3M. If you... If you haven't guessed by now, it is a very, very big company. Right? They have what's called a campus. And if you've seen the aerial photos of their campus, it's like a school that's just huge. Uh, Minnesota, right, in America. Yeah. Absolutely enormous, this particular business. All right? Minnesota is in America, isn't it? I'm right, Matt. Yeah. All right, a little bit of weight. But the reason why I'm saying it is because one of the things that they do very well is this research and development. They're an enormous company, but they do research and development. Let's just not stop at post-it notes. No, no, no. Let's make bigger sized post-it notes. What about smaller post-it notes? What about tiny little post-it notes? The whole lot, 3M. There was one that they made, you might have seen this, and it was post-it notes and they're inside your pen. So that you were writing and then you wanted to put a post-it note or something, you just pulled it out your pen and stuck it on the page. Yeah? What about um, 
Sell tape. Scotch tape. Three in. Yeah. Uh, fabric protector. Three. So anytime you've got clothes that you're worried that might get wet and get ruined in the rain, and you spray on special spray to protect them. Three in. How did they invent that? Well, they were inventing a glue. All right. And the guy spilt some of the glue on his shoe. And then he went, a walk, went for a walk outside across the campus. And when he got to where his lunch was, one shoe was dirty, the other shoe was clean. He had invented a fabric protector, which is now the fabric protector for pretty much all pouches and all of that all around the world. Anytime you see the word scotch, S-C-O-T-C-H, yes, scotch tape, for example, scotch guard, it's all free. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah, sticking plastic, band, band, band aid sort of idea. Yes, because it's the glue, it's the adhesive. That's where they started. Yeah. So they don't just stop at that product. So now what else can we do? Let's make this. How about we make this? How about we take exactly the same product and change it and make it slightly different? There are, if you've gone to stationery shops, you can actually buy giant sized post it notes, like really big ones. I don't know quite why you'd want them, but you can. Yeah. Research and development. In their job contracts, each person in the company is required in their job to make a new product. It's part of what they have to do. They sign on the dotted line. 20% of their job has to be about inventing a new product. Yeah? So it doesn't necessarily mean 20% each day. You could save it up and like spend the whole week trying to develop something. So they have to. A research and development is an internal economy of scale. This one's a bit more tricky. This idea is called risk bearing economies. And this is the idea where you are not just producing one product, you're producing five or ten or a hundred or a, yeah? All right, so if you've heard of companies like GlaxoSmithKline, okay? They don't produce one product, they produce hundreds of the things. All different types. You, did we look that up the other day? GlaxoSmithKline, you find out what they make. All right, anybody click on the Google? What does GlaxoSmithKline make? Yes, pharmaceuticals, to be precise. Hundreds of them. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, all sorts of different ones. So if you're ever in the shower at any point with a bottle of shampoo and you read the back of it, and there might be three letters, DSK. Right, so it's fine. But they don't produce one. This is this, this is this point. You're not producing one product, you're producing ten or a hundred or a thousand. Yeah. Apple doesn't just produce computers. Because what happens if everybody suddenly decides to stop buying the computers? They've lost all their money, their profits. So instead, they sometimes do really well on the iPhone, and sometimes they do really well in the sales of the Macs, and sometimes they do really well in the sales of the watches. And yeah, and if one is down, the other might be up. And if they're all up, the company's doing really well. March is it March? 23 that they're releasing all products. I think it's March 23. The rumor is that there's not going to be an iPhone 13. They're just not doing it. I'm very pleased about that. I don't like the idea of an iPhone 13. Not now. It's just, it's just too. It's not with the current state of the world we've got. No. All right. Uh, okay. Spreading the risk, producing a large array of products. Now, those were the internal ones. Those are the ones we as a business had control over. There are other economies of scale that we don't have control over. Those are the ones that are classified as external, outside of the control of the firm. Some of them are going to be really obvious. 
the labor force itself. The business has very little control over the people that they hire as to how skilled they are. Once they're employed, they can try and skill them up, absolutely. But the actual pool of people who apply, yeah. All right, I was hiring a, an economics teacher in New Zealand. This is going back a while. Okay. And I got probably about 100 applicants applying for this one job. But it was quite, it was actually quite easy to go through the applicants and go yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, because I was looking at the skill and experience of them and saying no, 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 all right? So I had a number of people applying to be an economics teacher who'd never taught economics before, and no qualifications in economics, just wanted a job at our school. Yeah. Good reputation. It's very difficult to control that. Yeah. You might find this as well in your lives, I don't know. Yeah. I grew up in a very small city say city, you kind of think city, it was only just qualifying as a city, yeah? More like a, a town with aspirations, yeah? And I, my father was one of seven, okay? So I have family quite a lot around that particular area. I didn't know them all, but my father was very well known, okay? Still is. And as a result, it was like, oh, look, you're his son. And I, I felt a bit, you know, because I wanted to be me, but all the time I was recognized as this person's son. I don't know if you get that sort of idea. Reputation. Yeah. It was always assumed that because I was his son, that I would be good at music. It was always assumed that because I was his son, I would be good as a teacher. Well, okay, yeah. Um, all of those sorts of things, and it might be the same for you. I don't know. Yeah. My sister has got a PhD, a doctorate in economics. So when I tell people that she's got a doctorate in economics, well, in fact, when I tell people she's got a doctorate, they ask me, "Oh, is it in economics?" Because of me. Not because of me that she's got that, right? She's got it first. Yeah. Okay. But the point is, is that there's that reputation idea, and it does follow you. If you've got older brothers or sisters, anybody? Yeah. Sometimes, are you the oldest, puppy? Are you the oldest? No. So if you've got an older brother or sister, sometimes people will say, Oh, we know your brother. We know your sister. And that, that reputation. Is there. Teachers have to work really hard with that, by the way. Yeah? Because we quite often will end up teaching the younger siblings of students that we've taught before. And then we have to kind of switch off that, that button that says, you know, that student may not have done well in this subject, or that student may not have been good at this, or that student really behaved badly, right? But because it's a new person that's in front of you. Yeah? It's one of the Asset teacher traps. I've fallen into it. Absolutely, I have. Not all the time. Specialist suppliers. We've got no control over that. We don't know what other businesses are out there. But maybe just per chance, we set up our business right next door to the people that we need to supply for our, our product. Specialist services. Just so happened to set up shop right next door to a business that we need service wise. Happened to set up and there's a local market just down the road. They want infrastructure, the roads, the electricity, the internet. All of those sorts of things that you have no control over, but the government does. And where you choose to set up your business 
is impacted by those. Yeah? Now, in New Zealand, they decided to build a new shopping centre. This is, again, going back a number of years. And they built it. And it's, it's New Zealand standards, very, very big. Okay? And in order to build this particular shopping centre where they wanted it to be, they actually had to build a new section of road that went off the main highway to connect to the shopping centre. It wasn't there before. The government said, all right, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll build you this road. The first day that shop was open, it blocked the highway, cars, both directions, all trying to get to the shopping centre. Infrastructure. What if it's not there? What if it is there? Yeah. I mean, I've said to you before, I mean, we, we've got no control here at school with regards to who the internet providers are. We have no control here at school with regards to the electricity providers. Yeah. 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 We have no control about the water provision. More less water. Right. That's your turn. Last thing, I think, you know, we might have a little bit more, but last thing possibly for the day. We'll see how we get on. Explain, not state, explain one external economy of scale. So what is it? How does the business benefit from it? Has anybody heard of a very, very big business called BP? BP? Oil, yeah. Uh, used to be known as British Petroleum. BP. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, they had a bit of a problem. One of their boats that was carrying a whole lot of oil crashed. And the oil leaked all into a really endangered area, killed a whole lot of wildlife, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of damage. Everybody was really quite upset with them. Well, the company had a damage to their reputation. So they had to figure out what to do. So one of the things that they did was they changed the color of their logo. Their logo was originally yellow. Then they changed it to be the color green. Why did they change it to be the color green? Because green is considered to be environmentally friendly. 
So these days, if you ever see green in logos, it's because they are trying to convince you that they are environmentally. This is an oil company encouraging you that they are environmentally friendly. They then went one step further and they changed their logo that they had into a giant flower, environmentally friendly. Works. If ever you don't believe marketing works, I can give you plenty of examples where it does. Have you heard of uh, this one? Whiskers Pet Food, big company. Uh, they sell cat food quite a lot. They might sell dog food, I don't know. But they sell uh, cat food. And their color was yellow. That was the color of all of the boxes, all of their marketing, everything was yellow. And then one day, someone said to them they need to change the color of their, their whole marketing, everything, packaging, logos, the whole lot. Change the color and you will see an increase in sales. And of course, everybody goes, oh, what? It's just changing the color. What they did is they changed the color from yellow to purple. Absolutely right. Immediately, an increase in sales of around about 30%. The only thing they had changed was the color of the box. That's it. So don't let anybody ever tell you that marketing doesn't work. Because it does. You are influenced by it all the time. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to finish the year. All right, we'll pick up where we left off next time. Uh, please, as I go through your work from time to time, if I'm sending you work back, uh, it might be that there's some feedback that you can you know, improve on. That would be a good thing to do. Uh, do start preparations for your mid-course. Start putting revision files, start putting work together, building revision notes, flashcards, the definitions. All of those sorts of things will be useful. Okay? Have a look through that list of information about what your mid-course is going to be on and about. And again, if you have questions about that, you can either email me or you can come and see me at some point in the right? But you need to kind of start now right, with the build-up for that. Otherwise, as we say in the land of my birth, they call it up. We use the buy for now. Uh, pink stuff for your desks and blue stuff for your hands. Thank you and goodbye.